Now, Catherine Hayhoe is like Superwoman. Somehow she can be in four or five different places at the same time. She's teaching as a distinguished professor at Texas Tech University. She's advancing her own scientific research. At the same time, she's taking the lead on UN climate reports. She's authoring the US national climate assessments. She's acting as chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Meanwhile, she's also active in the Christian evangelical community and serves as climate ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance. Honestly, the list goes on. So much so that Catherine has been named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people and one of Foreign Policy Magazine's 100 leading global thinkers. And in spite of all this, she finds time to speak to thousands of ordinary Americans and Canadians about climate change every year. And today she's found time to speak to me. Professor Hayhoe, thanks for being on Smart Prosperity, the podcast. Thank you for having me. Uh, Professor Hayhoe, you do what other climate scientists don't dare do, which is you speak with ordinary people. Your new book is based on thousands of conversations at rotary clubs, church groups, city planning meetings, colleges, uh, even the odd oil and gas convention. Um, you're crisscrossing the U.S. in order to have conversations about climate change. Why is that so important to you? Climate change is not only a science issue, it's not only an environmental issue, it's not only a policy issue, climate change is a human issue. It affects every single one of us in ways that matter to us. And if we don't think that it does, if we don't think climate change matters to us, it's only because we haven't connected the dots between everything that's already at the top of our personal priority lists and how climate change is affecting it. So I feel a little bit like a physician who's done a scan of a patient and discovered some disturbing symptoms and then found out that everybody in the world shares these symptoms Everybody is vulnerable to the impacts of this new condition, but everybody has a role to play in helping to solve it. So as a physician, how could you not want to share that news with everyone that you know and everybody who shares this planet with us? It's, it's funny that you make a, the physician, use the physician metaphor, because the one that popped to mind while I was reading your book is the therapist metaphor. Um, you're having these conversations, you're speaking to people, but you're listening to people and you're connecting with people and, and you're bonding with people um, in a way that I, I feel like you've become America's climate therapist. What, what are all these conversations telling you about attitudes towards climate change in the U.S. right now? Well, it's really interesting because growing up in Canada, I had never met anyone who didn't think that climate change is real until I moved to the States. So I went to the University of Toronto um, and then looked around for good graduate schools and found a fantastic advisor down at the University of Illinois who did very policy relevant science. I wanted to do science that could actually make a difference in the world if I was going to study climate change. So going down there was the first time where I started to realize there were quite a few people who didn't think this thing was real. And then I started to meet many of those people. And then I started to realize, wow, I have so much in common with these people, whether it's, you know, we're both in academia or a shared faith or a shared interest. And these are smart people. They're not uneducated. They're people who know and understand and accept most of the rest of science. So that was where I started thinking, well, what is going on? If it's not lack of education, which we often assume it is, if it's not lack of smarts, which we too, all too often assume it is, what is really going on? And through all of those conversations, and of course, listening is a huge part of that because I wanted to know what were they thinking? That's where I discovered what the social science now tells us. In the United States, you can see it the most clearly, but it is very present in Australia. It is absolutely 100% present in Canada. I have seen it in the UK as well, and even a little bit in Europe. And it is this, that the number one predictor of what, whether we agree that climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious and action is needed, is simply where we fall on the political spectrum. That is it. But here's the thing, a, temp a thermometer doesn't give us a different number if we're conservative or liberal or NDP or even green, it's still the same number. And south of the border, you don't get a different number if you're Republican or Democrat either. So then I started to explore ways that people already cared about things that were being affected by climate change and tried to connect the dots while walking right around the political minefield, so to speak. And 
that's when I became convinced through all of those conversations I talk about in my book, Saving Us, I really became convinced that just about every single person already has every reason they need to care about climate change. And again, if they don't think they do, it's simply because they haven't connected the dots. They don't need new values. They don't have to change who they are. In fact, often caring about and acting on climate change helps us to be an even more genuine version of who we already are, a better parent, uh, uh, more genuine conservatives in the sense of someone who actually conserves, a better steward of our land, a person who's actually more invested in whether it's a winter sport that we love or fishing or the neighborhood or city where we live. And, and in your new book, you encourage all of us to be having these kinds of conversations. Um, in fact, you, you say that we're not having enough of these conversations and, and we need to be talking more about it. Um, and you provide us with some of the tools to do this. But it's it's tricky, and and you know by recounting so many of the conversations that you've been having, you know it's clear that often these are these conversations are with people who disagree with you, who are skeptical, who are even hostile towards uh, climate science. How how do we navigate those conversations? Well, often when I say have a conversation, our minds immediately jump to that person we know who absolutely rejects anything to do with the science. They can't help bringing it up in conversation all the time, like a sore tooth. They just can't leave it alone. <laughs> Talking about how Al Gore faked the data or those climate scientists are just making it up or wasn't it cold this winter? I can show you what temperature it was in January last winter and it was freezing. And so often that's exactly who our mind jumps to when I say have a conversation. But here's something really radical. I have had thousands of conversations with people who are dismissive about climate change. And the phrase dismissive comes from the six Americas of global warming, which is a useful metric that the Yale program on climate communication put together, where they divide people not up into two groups, not up into you know, believers and deniers, so to speak, but six groups. We've got alarmed, concerned, and cautious. And those are the biggest groups by far in the US and Canada and beyond. And then we've got disengaged, a tiny little group of people who apparently have been living under a rock for the last 20 years, and then <laughs> slightly larger, about 12% doubtful and about 7 or 8% dismissive. So I've had many conversations with dismissives, and my best advice with them is don't. Unless okay. you enjoy banging your head against a wall, <laughs> and that is something that brings you personal satisfaction, don't bother. So the only time I engage a dismissive is if there's other people listening and they want to know that I have an answer to their questions. Uh -huh. here's the thing. 93% of us are not dismissive. And that means with 93% of us, maybe not Uncle Joe, but with 93% of us, we can have that conversation where we begin with shared values, something we both have in common, connect the dots to climate change and bring in something positive and constructive that we could do that helps make us part of the solution rather than part of the problem, because everybody wants to be the solution. Nobody wants to be the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so more conversations, maybe not with those 7% of dismissives uh, in the US, and, and we do have them in Canada too. I, I know one well, we that do. lives on my street. <laughs> yep. Um, well, I, there's one man from Toronto who sent me a number of letters over the years. Some of the, some of the best <laughs> names come from those letters. Handmade, Antichrist, High Priestess of the Beast. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, gosh. How, how, how do you keep up your, your optimism and your empathy when you know, you're, you're getting barraged with, with uh, angry letters from, from those 7%. Well, I'm definitely human. And, when, and with the overwhelming, you know, disrespect and hostility and insults that come at you, there's definitely days where I just feel down or frustrated or angry. But when you kind of stay, take a step back and you say, they don't know me, they're just reacting out of fear, which then translates itself into anger over something that they feel like they have no control over and they're reacting in a very unhealthy way that is not going to affect them in any positive manner. I mean, penning screeds to people you've never met, calling them horrible names is not something that's going to make you ultimately feel better about yourself or what you do. Um, so, so that's sort of how I think of those people. And I try not to spend too much time in it because if you immerse yourself arguing with people, that's when you really get frustrated and you use up all your emotional energy and you use up all of your time doing something that's frankly pointless. Mm. Whereas if we can find points of connection, that's where we can really remind ourselves that as humans, there's far more that connects us than divides us. And we can do that across Canada. We can do that even across the US. I mean, 
I live in Texas. If you can do it in Texas, I feel like you can do it anywhere. <laughs> I, I believe it. Um, in fact, yeah, in your, in your famous TED Talk of 2018, you said not only do you live in Texas, but you live in what has been voted the second most conservative city uh, in the United States. Um, so uh, so it, it's an impressive testing ground. Um, have you noticed any change? So, you know, a lot's happened over the past year and a bit, um, including, you know, a change of leadership in the United States. Um, has does a different president obviously it means different climate policies does it mean anything different when it comes to attitudes uh american attitudes towards climate change on the ground well here's the interesting thing american politics because it's so binary right you only have two choices it has not reflected american attitudes for several years now, the majority of people in the United States have been either alarmed or concerned about climate change. Remember, according to those six categories I talked about. Mm -hmm. So if the majority are alarmed and concerned, shouldn't, shouldn't we be seeing change happen? Well, unfortunately, the U.S. political system with its you know, um, carefully drawn lines to districts and all of its uh, issues with voting and getting people to the polls, with the political system in the US, unfortunately, climate action has been a victim to these systematic and systemic issues that run through the political process in the US, many of them going back decades and even potentially centuries. So in Canada, for example, in our last federal election um, back a few years ago, every major political party had a climate plan. Now, granted, when Andrew Leach and I analyzed those plans, we found that the conservative plan would probably actually increase carbon emissions, but at least they had a plan. They can do better. Hopefully, it will do better this time. Whereas in the U.S., it's more like one party takes the position like this isn't even real. And you can say gravity isn't real, but if you step off the cliff, you're going down. And if you are the leader of a country and you say it isn't real and you take no actions to prepare for the impacts and no actions to avoid the worst of the consequences, you're taking the entire country off the cliff with you. And that is not only irresponsible, that's morally wrong. Now, you're engaging with all sorts of communities that I'm sure no other climate experts are engaging with. Um, whether they're at the roading, you might be surprised. Ro you might be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not giving the other climate experts enough credit, um, but certainly, you know, you deserve a lot of credit. Um, one group in particular, one that you have a special connection with, and that I'm curious about, is the Christian evangelical community. How does that community react to to climate science? Mm -hmm. Well, so in my book, I do share about a few of my amazing colleagues who climate scientists in general realize that we are like the physicians of the planet and we know why the earth is running a fever and we have to tell people. So one of my colleagues, Henry Drake is a gamer. So he gets on Twitch and talks about climate change as he's playing Fortnite or other games. Um, and then another one of my colleagues is an ice hockey player. So he's analyzed the seasons, the length of the season at all the outdoor rinks and ponds in his area. So he can tell his fellow hockey players, many of whom are a bit skeptical, what's happening. So believe me, climate scientists are definitely trying. Okay. But, but these illustrate um, one of the main points that I've discovered for myself and that I try to share in my book, which is the best place for each of us to connect is with people whose values we share. So if you're a gamer, connect with gamers. If you're a hockey player, connect with hockey players. If you're a person of faith, connect with people who share your faith. Now, here's the thing, coincidentally, or maybe not, in the United States, when you look at the groups of people who are most hostile to the idea that climate is changing and we need to do something about it, those people are primarily white evangelical Protestants, closely followed by white Catholics. Those are the two people groups in the United States that most reject the impacts of a changing climate. And they tend to use not only science-y, but also religious-y sounding arguments or excuses. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be cute with the why there. By science-y, I mean they sound like science, but they're not. And by religious-y, I mean they sound religious, but they're actually not. They're not. Mm -hmm. um, but here's the thing. It turns out that the most concerned people group in the United States is Hispanic Catholics. 
And that's where you start to see things break down because Hispanic Catholics, they're both Catholic. They have the same Pope. Pope Francis wrote a whole encyclical, a book talking about climate change and Christian responsibility towards the poor. So what's going on there? Is it really where people go to church? Well, if that's the case, you know, why does the World Evangelical Alliance, which represents 600 evangelicals around the world, including Canada, why do they take climate change so seriously that their secretary general was an official delegate to the Paris conference uh -huh. for his country, the Philippines? Why do they ask me to be their climate ambassador? So when you start to dig a little bit deeper, you start to see it is not where people go to church or what religious label they do or don't adhere to that's causing this divide. It is the deliberate concatenation of politics and religion in the United States that has been happening. It actually started way back at the beginning of the American Revolution when they broke the ties with, with um, the churches based in England. But it continued with a vengeance through the 80s with the whole moral majority movement. There was a concerted effort, a lot of thought, a lot of planning, a lot of money put into taking theologically conservative people and moving them over to the politically conservative side of the spectrum. So that's the political landscape. And so now for many people in the US, their statement of faith is written primarily by their political ideology and only a distant second by what they profess to believe. And if the Bible for Catholics or Protestants comes into conflict with their political beliefs, they will go with their politics over the Bible. And so really it's a form of political ideology sort of masked as a religion with a little Christian label stuck on it, rather than what the Bible calls true religion, which is caring for others, caring for the widows and orphans, caring for people who are marginalized and disadvantaged, the very people who are most impacted by climate change. That's what the Bible says true religion is, caring for those people. Uh, um you know, I, I have to say, I found your book absolutely fascinating. And, and for those watching on video, I'm going to hold it in front of the camera. It's called Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. In a way, these conversations and interactions that you recount reveal much more than just people's attitudes towards climate change. You're actually exposing and dissecting what I think are some deep-rooted or, or a deep-rooted psychology that probably underlies Americans' attitudes towards lots of things. I mean, for example, you speak to this, this, uh, this uncomfortable mix of religion and politics, um, for example. Um, at one point in the book, you call on some research done by Duke University to suggest mm -hmm. that those Americans who doubt or dismiss climate change, they don't actually have a problem with climate science. They may say they do, but actually what they have a problem with are climate solutions. Because what they read between the lines uh, is that when scientists warn them about climate change, is that any solution requires big government. And as, the, as you point out, anything that reeks of big government immediately triggers an objection with conservative Americans. Do you feel like in, in having these conversations uh, that you've been having, um, that you're tapping into some deep and maybe murky corners of, of American identity? Oh, yes. <laughs> you are so right. Climate denial is just one aspect of this whole sort of ball of ideology and attitudes and perspectives. It's a symptom rather than a cause. And as I talk about in the intro to the book, because of course I was writing the book during COVID, when the whole um, objection to actions to slow down COVID, when the whole idea of planking the curve and social distancing came out and all the resistance to that, when now the whole idea of, I don't wanna put a mask on my face to love my neighbor and protect people who are not able to get the vaccine, or I don't want to get the vaccine, even though that would help to eventually lead to herd immunity because it's my body. And if I get sick, I don't mind being a drain on the system by being yeah. sick and I'll take whatever experimental drug you offer me when I'm sick. But heaven forbid that I take a vaccine seen now, even if it's just been approved by the FDA. So all of these attitudes, and it relates to other things like immigration, like nationalism, like, you know, how you vote, attitudes towards guns, it all goes together. It's the same toxic stew of attitudes that are frankly motivated by fear, fear of change. The world is changing too quickly. And often when we feel like it's kind of slipping out of control, that we're being pushed to the back of the line, that other people are jumping ahead of us, that we're losing things that we felt like we had, we're losing privileges or status or something that we feel like we had, it's been taken away from us. Our reaction is to hold on to that even tighter. And we see this most obviously in the US 
as I think of it as a scientist, the signal to noise ratio in the US is higher than any other country around the world. <laughs> you got the background noise and then you got this massive signal. But to be totally honest with you, I completely see this in Canada too. So whenever people attack me on social media, which happens every single day, before I block them, I actually look at their profiles because I'm curious who would do that? Who would just go get on social media? And in some cases they even create a brand new account just to do this. and send these really hateful messages to somebody that they've never met before. Who would do that? Well, I can tell you if they're from Canada and quite a few of them are, unfortunately, nine times out of 10, or maybe even 99 times out of hundred sometimes, they won't just have something about climate change in their profile, or sometimes they won't even have anything about climate change. But I can guarantee you that they will be very proud of their country. They will hate the prime minister. They are likely either a PC or a PPC member they are usually from the Middle West and they love the oil and gas industry and they don't like all those immigrants that are taking over the country. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and they're usually male. And Not always. Usually uh, probably white males. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's fascinating. And, and do you think, I mean, given that the scale and severity of climate change probably does require, you know, a dose of big government, whether, whether, you know, regardless of, of whether you like it or not, is conservative America just hardwired to oppose climate action or, or is there a pathway for them to get on board with, with, uh, with some of the solutions that, uh, that we need to see in order to, to tackle this problem? Well, what I try to argue in my book, and my book is not really about solutions per se, but I need to talk about them, right? Because that's a big part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. There's so many solutions that have immediate benefits. So, you know, right up the middle most conservative part of the United States is where we have the greatest wind and solar energy potential, which grows local rural economies and reinvests in areas of the country that have sort of been, you know, been triaging uh, young people and jobs and resources for the last few decades. When we look at nature-based solutions, a lot of those involve farmers. Farmers tend to be politically conservative, but they are a really big part of the climate fight and they can be our, some of our biggest heroes. Then there's also free market mechanisms. I talk about Bob Inglis in the book, who is a two-time Republican congressman from South Carolina, very conservative, top rating in all the conservative you know, scorecards and valuations. And then he was going up for his third term so, you know, third term, you know, very successful. And his son came to him and his son said, dad, I'm old enough to vote now, but I cannot vote for you if you continue to deny climate change because it's the truth and we need to act on it. And Bob is a person of deep integrity. He's also a man of faith. And so he said, all right, son, I will look at this thing. He said, be, to be totally honest with you, and this is what he would literally say, so I'm not putting words in his mouth. He would say, to be totally honest, all I knew about climate change was if Al Gore was for it, I was against it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's the way most people are, right? Yeah. But Bob took a second look at it. He realized it was real. All he did was say, yeah, climate change is real and we should talk about free market solutions for it. And he lost in the primaries. Wow. But he went on to found an institute that actually proposes free market solutions that take, you know, they use market mechanisms that conservatives can get on board with to help correct the massive fossil fuel subsidies that are currently in the market. It's not a free market. We're massively skewed in the direction of keeping our current dependence on fossil fuels. And so I try to highlight those solutions, not to recommend any specific solution, but rather to show people there is a menu as big as a diner for climate solutions. <laughs> and you can go to whatever section you like. You can go to the breakfast section. You can go to the dessert section. You can go wherever you want. And there is a climate solution that you can get on board with and you can support. Wow. Um, now I wanna jump over to, to some current events and get your, get your thoughts on them. For, for one, you, know, you mentioned in the book that as Americans uh, and, and as you know, these climate doubters, uh, even dismissives, begin to see the climate impacts uh, for themselves, that that might uh, that that'll kind of budge them into uh, into the climate solution support column. Um, we've had a heavy dose of those uh, just in the past couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, your book's coming out at, at a heck of a time. Um, you know, all, all, all we need, all we need, is a major hurricane, and that sort of completes the trifecta of this terrible. Oh my year. God! And, and you know, it, it, that's certainly not out of the question, is it? Um, no. So, you know, first of all, as a climate science, what, what do you make of the past few months? 
Well, the biggest way that we see climate change affecting us as humans in the places where we live is by climate change loading the weather dice against us. So the way I think about it is wherever you live, we always we already have two sixes on our weather dice. So if you live out west, there's always a chance of a wildfire. If you live here in central Ontario, there's always a chance of a flood or a summer heat wave. If you live over in Halifax, there's always a chance of a tropical storm making it all the way up and hitting the Maritimes. So we always have that chance on our weather dice of rolling a double six. But as the world warms decade by decade, it's as if climate change is sneaking in and taking another one of those numbers and turning it into a six, and then another one, and then taking another number and turning it into a seven. And so all of a sudden we're rolling a double seven on this pair of dice. And we're like, where did this come from? That's what's happening to us now in spades. So mm. because there's an element of chance, some years we might be like, wow, this really wasn't a very bad year. But other years we're like, what just happened? Things are not normal. And what's happening is it's not so much that the 7% of dismissives are changing their minds. Honestly, I truly believe it would take a miracle to change their minds. And I feel like I've seen maybe two or three miracles over 10 years, but not a lot of them. <laughs> but the bigger problem we have is those of us who are in the middle. The vast majority of us in Canada and in the US over the last 10 years, we've been right in the middle. Who's in the middle? People who say, yes, climate is changing. Yes, humans are responsible. Yes, the impacts are probably serious in the future to people who live over there in developing countries and to plants and animals, but not to me here and now. And when it gets to be a problem, people like David Suzuki will take care of it. That's the biggest problem we have is the people <laughs> in the middle. And David Suzuki, I mean, that man has been carrying everything he can. Oh you know, my since gosh. And, and, he, and, he can't, and he can't be around forever, can he? <laughs> no, he can't, although he is still going strong, which is amazing. So that's the biggest problem we have is the people in the middle. And these are the people who are looking at what's happening. We're looking at the choking wildfire smoke in the air, even over in Ontario. We had smoke not just from the wildfires at the border with Manitoba this summer. We got some of the smoke all the way from BC. You could see it in the bronze air. You could breathe it. You could even smell it. So we're starting to realize, no, it is not in the future anymore. It's now, it's not over there, it's here. And it's not only plants and animals, it's us too. And that's what's making the biggest difference, I think, in the shift of people who are sort of in the middle into the alarmed category. So much so that I actually contacted Tony and Ed, who are um, the two researchers in charge of that, that Six Americas uh, uh, program. And I said, I, would, I think you need to break down the alarm now because the alarms are getting so big. And I talk to people who have so many different perspectives. Can you break them down? Uh -huh. Because I have a suspicion that a lot of people who are alarmed, which is now getting to be the biggest group in Canada and the US, aren't doing anything about it because they don't know what to do. Huh. That was my suspicion. Mm -hmm. So they studied the alarm. And unfortunately their study came out right after I finished the book. And I was like, dang it, because this is exactly what I wanted. Because I had the suspicion, but I didn't want to say it in the book if I didn't know it was true. But they found out that's exactly the case. A lot of us are concerned or alarmed, but we don't know what to do. We're frozen. So that is who I wrote the book to. I didn't write the book to dismissives or doubtfuls. I wrote the book to people who are already cautious, concerned, or alarmed, and they just feel like, well, who am I? I'm not a president or a prime minister or a CEO or a celebrity. What on earth am I supposed to do about this problem? And where do I find hope? That's the biggest question I've gotten the last few years. Yeah. Well, they go together. I think it was Joan Baez who originally said that um, action is the antidote to despair, I believe. And psychology really shows that that's right, that action precedes hope. And by acting ourselves, by joining up with others, by using our voice to advocate for change, by participating in that process of changing the world, and the only way it's ever changed in the past is because individuals decided it had to. Again, not the prime ministers and presidents and CEOs. It was just ordinary people. That's where we actually find hope. Hmm. And, and it reminds me of uh, a couple fun anecdotes that you have in the book, uh, which show that action, yes, is the antidote to despair. It's also, surprisingly, uh, the antidote 
to perhaps uh, skepticism or uh, to dragging your heels on on climate change. I'll I'll leave that as a bit of a you know a, a bit of a suspense for for listeners and and they can go find that anecdote for themselves in your book. Oh yes, um, so so that's that's the story of John's dad, and I'm not going to tell that story either because it is one of my favorites. And you have to read the book. To it is so <laughs> it is so good. Um, it is it is one of those really you know that those those stories that really does inspire hope uh, and and some optimism for the future. Um, I know I've only got a couple more minutes of your time, and I want to I want to ask you about the latest UN climate science report, uh, the sixth ever global assessment by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It, of course, too, just came out this summer. Um, this is a scientific body that you've contributed to in the past. Were you involved at all with with this one? I was not involved with this when I was working on the U.S. National Climate Impact Assessment instead, mm -hmm. but. Um, this, the science that I do and the science that many other scientists do, all of that goes into these reports because these reports are a compilation of all the published science. So this is the sixth assessment report. The first one came out in 1990. The first thing to start with is what's not new. And because often we think, okay, well, everything's got to be new in it. What's not new is we have known that climate is changing since a British engineer called Guy Callender, who was born in Canada and lived in Canada until he was four oh, years old. Canadian. So we'll claim him. Yes, <laughs> Guy Callender published a paper in 1937 showing that the global average temperature was increasing due to burning fossil fuels, 1937. Wow. We've known that, at least hypothetically, if you dug up and burned coal producing heat trapping gases that wrapped an extra blanket around the planet, the planet would warm since the work of Mrs. Eunice Newton Foote, who was an amateur scientist living in upstate New York. Again, not too far from Canada. You see the common denominator here. <laughs> That's right. I like everything has to have a connection to Canada for, for our listeners to keep listening. Exactly. <laughs> so we've known for, you know, almost 100 years and more than 100 years that climate is changing and humans are responsible. We've been convinced enough of the severity of the risks that scientists first warned a U.S. president in 1965 that climate change was serious and required political action. And of course, pioneering NASA climate scientist Jim Hansen testified to Congress in the hot, hot summer of 1988, saying, you know, there's an unequivocal human impact on climate. So that's not new. What's new? What's new is, first of all, there is no shadow of doubt to hide behind, not only that climate is changing and humans are responsible, but that the impacts are here and they are now and they're affecting our extreme weather events, making heat waves hotter and more intense and more deadly, making heavy rainfall more frequent rising seas, stronger cyclones, typhoons, and hurricanes, and wildfires burning greater area. We can connect the dots. And in fact, we can even put a number on how much worse humans have made certain events. Wow. So the devastating heat wave out West, followed by the wildfires, scientists have been able to calculate that climate change loaded the dice to such an extent that that event became more than 150 times more likely. I mean, isn't that insane? That like that's that's a big, big difference. Yeah. So that's and it's amazing new. that the science that the science is now able to to say that. Yes, and like for Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston in 2017, the science is able to calculate that about 40 percent of the rain that fell during that record-breaking hurricane, which in some places was well over 50 inches, 40 percent of the rain would not have happened if the same hurricane had occurred 100 years ago, wow. which it easily could have, but it wouldn't have had as much rain, and three quarters of the economic damages would never have occurred because the first 20 inches people are mostly prepared for in Houston, they get a lot of rain. The next 10 inches, the damages are greater. Then when you're talking like 40 and 50 inches, that's where you have damages that you did not prepare for at all. And that's where you see the greatest economic impact. So that was new in the report. And what is also not new, but emerging stronger and stronger, so you can't miss it is the clear call that our future is in our hands and the time to act is now. There is no longer any excuse. There is nothing to hide behind. There is no uncertainty or prevarication in that message. The science is crystal clear and this report declares it with no equivocation whatsoever. Now is the best time to act. And if not now, as soon as possible. How much? As much as possible. Because the faster we cut our carbon emissions off, the better off every single one of us will be. Mm. And, you know, again, the timing is, uh, is opportune. The international community meeting in Glasgow in November, 
for what everyone appears to agree is a critical meeting to address climate change. Are you optimistic? I have what I call rational hope. <laughs> and that begins with an awareness of how serious it is. I mean, we're not gonna fix this thing by sort of putting our hands over our eyes or our ears and pretending that it's all okay or some technology experts can invent some magic solution to fix it. It is really bad. Climate is changing faster than any time in the history of human civilization on this planet. We're already experiencing the impacts today and some additional impacts are inevitable. It's as if we've been smoking a pack of cigarette a day for day, you know, years and even decades. Mm. We already have some impaired breathing. We already have some spots in our lungs. But we don't have emphysema. We don't have lung cancer. And we're not dead yet. So that means that there is hope because we have a choice to make. And our choice will affect our future. I study our future options. This is literally what I do. I was talking earlier with you about how during the pandemic, I didn't just write Saving Us. I also wrote a book with my colleagues, um, a technical book um, on high resolution climate projections. Why do I do those? I do them because people, water districts, cities, companies, um, farming organizations, ecosystem managers, uh, water managers, people, people who need information to plan, they need to know that the biggest uncertainty in our future is us. Our choices that determine our heat trap and gas emissions have the biggest influence on what's going to happen. And if we take serious, rapid, meaningful steps to cut our carbon emissions today as much as possible, as soon as possible, we will see a future that is still a little bit warmer than today, but it is manageable, it is adaptable, we can prepare for it, and human civilization will survive. But if we do not heed the warning signs that our planet is giving us today, and scientists are clearly communicating in ever more urgent tones, we will see changes so large that our human civilization, our food systems, our water systems, our infrastructure systems, even our geopolitical and our economic systems, they will not be able to cope with those changes. That is what is at stake is human civilization as we know it, and our choices will determine which path we take. Not dead yet. Uh, I love that quote. I, I know you've, you've just got a, boat, a book about to come out called Saving Us, but I think it's time to start writing the next book called Not Dead Yet. <laughs> I have to cite Princess Bride when I do. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Catherine, one, one last question for you. Uh, you live and raise your family in Texas, but you're always quick to tell people that you're Canadian. It's in your Twitter byline. You mentioned it off the top in your, in your TED Talks. Um, why do you do that? Are Americans more comfortable having conversations about climate change with a Canadian? Climate change is the number one most politically polarized issue in the whole country, in the US. Number one. As of this past summer, race and racial issues were number two, of course, with the Black Lives Matter movement. Coronavirus was number three. And then you have issues of immigration and gun control and all the traditional sort of, you know, Republican Democrat issues, but climate change is number one and it has been at or around number one since the Obama administration. Wow. So the first thing people often want to know when you start a conversation about climate change is where do you fall on the political spectrum in the United States because I'm just going to immediately pigeonhole you there. Yeah. And if we don't agree, we have nothing to talk about. <laughs> but with us Canadians, it's like the pigeon is here and you're like, okay, pigeon, which side are you? And the pigeon's like, well, I'm Canadian. And you're like, Canadian, where do I put this pigeon? I mean, I have to listen to it for a little longer before I shove it in a hole somewhere. <laughs> and that gives you the opportunity to have that conversation with people. Because again, a thermometer is not left or right. It's not liberal or conservative. Climate change affects every single one of us. And a hurricane doesn't stop to ask who you voted for in the last election before it destroys your house. A wildfire doesn't ask what political party you're affiliated with before it burns down your neighborhood. Every single one of us already has every reason we need to care. And I need to keep every, every tool I can to help people listen to this um, without falling over the judgments that so often immediately trip us up. Well, uh, you're doing all of us a service. You're doing the world a service. Thank you. Uh, I hope you keep it up. Um, for everybody listening, um, Saving Us will be on bookshelves uh, September 20th, I believe. Um, and you can pre-order now. Yes, and I have to say, honestly, the part I'm most excited about, and you'll understand this, of course, and everybody listening probably will be too, is that the final version, which you do not have a copy of there, you have one of the advanced copies, the final oh. version has a nice Twitter endorsement on the cover from Margaret Atwood. Oh, really? And that's going to appear on American copies also? Yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. 
Well, so as a Canadian, uh, you just sort of feel like, oh, that's just amazing. If Margaret absolutely. Atwood cares about climate change, which she does, of course, deeply, she's written about it extensively. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, we probably have a chance. You know, in, in, the Guild of Superheroes, you know, you mentioned David Suzuki, Margaret Atwood, uh, Professor Catherine Hayhoe. I think I think you are absolutely an honorary member of the Guild. Um, it's been so fun talking to you. Thank you for taking the time out to uh, to speak to me today.